Et bienvenue à la deuxième séance de la huitième saison de Recherche en Lumière à l'École de Musique Chouli. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second session of the eighth season of Research Alive at Chouli School of Music. With this series, we aim to bring alive humanistic, scientific, and engineering research in music, as well as the research that goes on behind the scenes in music performance and composition. Our aim is to better understand the inner workings of the magical world of musical practice and scholarship, illustrated with live music. We have a lot of live musicians up here today, so that's good. Uh, the next sessions in the winter semester will be presented by the finalists of the Research Alive Student Prize, which is generously funded by Jill de Villafranca and Dr. David Kostick. Uh, the third prize winner, Stuart Jackson, will discuss the historically informed performance practice in composer John Cage's cartridge music in the Music Research Doctoral Colloquium on February 10th. First prize winner, Theodora Nesarova, a soprano, would take sides in the vibrato wars on f February 21st. And second prize winner, Megan Batty, will present choreo musical conversations in Montreal swing dance with live musicians and dancers on stage on March 14th, both here in Tanishula Hall. So congratulations to this year's prize winners. We're delighted that today's session is a joint effort between Research Alive and McGill Library's Rare Books and Special Collections team, who have provided some medieval chant manuscripts for the occasion. The talk will be presented by music technologist and digital music archivist, Professor Ichiro Fujinaga, and musicologist uh, Julie Cumming, who created, they both created the Shirk Partnership Project, SIMSA, which is the single interface for music score searching. They're also joined by Anne-Marie Holland, librarian of the Rare Books and Special Collections, Anna de Backer, postdoctoral research associate on the SIMSA project, Geneviève Gates Panison, uh, leader, lead tester of the SIMSA project, who will be presented by uh, interposed video, as well as a magnificent group of chanters. So please welcome our guests. Hello, so I'm gonna start by telling you about chant. So chant is central to Christian worship in medieval and Renaissance Europe. Um, and um, in, in the Middle Ages, they thought that there were three kinds of people. Um, there were those who work, and those are people who grow food and build houses and make clothes, all those kinds of people. Then there's those who fight, knights and soldiers. And then there's those who pray, monks and nuns who pray for the salvation of the whole society. So most Christian, and most Christian prayer was set to music. So monks and nuns spent most of their time singing. And understanding the role of music in worship is central to understanding the Middle Ages. So there's two main sort of categories of musical worship, and one is called the divine office or the liturgical hours. And in fact, that means that the monks and nuns got together eight times a day to sing. And they sang, got up in the middle of the night and sang matins around 2 a.m. They got up at dawn and sang lauds. Then in the, during the day, they sang every three hours, but just for about 20 minutes each time. And then at sunset, they sang vespers. And then at, right before going to bed, they sang Compline. Um, and so you can see, this is what they were, there's their full-time job, more than full-time job, was basically singing. And then mass would happen on Sundays in churches and uh, cathedrals and in monasteries, but it would happen every day in the monasteries. Um, and so that had a whole nother set of music different from the music that was in the divine office. Um, so the person who set up the divine office was St. Benedict in the early 500s. And he describes the duties of monks and nuns and the organization of the monastery. He actually tells you, well, you have to have somebody who's gonna take care of the food and of the wine, and you have to have rules about when people can go outside and when they can't and so forth. But a central part of the rule of St. Benedict is about the singing of psalms. And he said the whole Psalter of 150 psalms must be said every week because monks show too lax a service in their devotion who chant less than the whole Psalter in the course of a week. Since our holy forefathers fulfilled in one day 
what we lukewarm monks should perform at least in a week. So he really is emphasizing this and he's thinking back to the really, really, you know, those hermits who went and all they did all day was, was say the Psalms. Um, but part of the rule of St. Benedict actually explains how the Psalms are divided up over the course week of the week. So you start in Sunday matins and you have, you know, one to five there and so forth and go through the whole thing and then you start the whole cycle again the next week. Um, Benedict also talked about how you should sing, how you should feel when you sing, how you should think about God when you sing. So let us always be mindful of what the prophet David, and that's the person who wrote the Psalms, um, how he, he said, serve the Lord with fear. So think about God and fear him when you're singing. Sing wisely, also try and sing well and wisely, and I will sing praise to thee in the sight of the angels. So he says, Therefore, let us consider how we should behave in the sight of God and his angels. And let us so stand to sing that our mind may be in harmony with our voice. And I think, I hope you'll see that our minds are in harmony with our voice when we actually sing today. So um, let's look at one of the examples from the McGill chant manuscripts. Now the chants we've chosen to sing today are all from the McGill collection. Um, and they're all about the Virgin Mary. They're all chants used uh, in, in honor of the Virgin Mary with texts about her. Um, and chant texts are, are all kinds of things. They're from the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, the life of Jesus, the lives of the saints, all kinds of things. Uh, but central was this figure of Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was a universal mother who would intercede with God to achieve salvation for the people. So we've chosen to focus on these chants for this presentation because of her centrality in the liturgy. So here's one page from a Miguel chant manuscript. And uh, we can see uh, on this um, manuscript that there's um, some music and there's also a bunch of words written in red, and those words written in red actually tell you what kind of music is on the page. So here it says, Feria Quinta Ad Vesperas, and that means Feria is a weekday, so the fifth weekday is Friday, and Vespers is the evening season, evening, evening uh, uh, service. Um, and, um, and then it's an antiphon, um, and that's a particular kind of piece, which I'll explain in a minute. So these labels, it says Ad Vesperas at the top, and then we see the description of what day of the week you sing it. Those are directions for when you sing this piece, and those are in red ink, and that's where the term rubrics comes from, is the red ink in these manuscripts that tell you what's supposed to be happening. Um, so, um, uh, the, oh, the antiphon is sung with a Magnificat, and uh, it actually says that also in the top left corner, it says um, ad magnificat antiphon, uh, and that's in the little blocks on the left. And the text of the antiphon is actually taken from the magnificat, and the magnificat is always sung at vespers. So the text of the magnificat is, comes from the Gospel of Luke. And uh, we have Mary, pregnant with Jesus, who goes to meet her cousin Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist. And the Bible says, in those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And so that's the little baby John the Baptist is leaping to greet the little baby inside Mary, Jesus, okay? And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And that's a very popular text also for chance. And then Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, magnificat anima mea domini, and my spirit rejoices the God my savior. And this text that goes on is the Magnificat. So when you, uh, and the Magnificat is actually in the form of the Psalm. It's a special kind of poem in which you have lines of uneven lengths which all divide into two parts. Uh, and um, so the kind of thing you'll hear us when we sing the Magnificat is just the ki same kind of music that you hear when you sing the Psalms. So, um, the choice of the reciting tone for the, magni for the Magnificat is shown here. This a Magnificat, and ya da 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 dum. It tells you how the Magnificat melody starts, and at the end, it tells you how it ends with these vowels, A U O U I M. 
which is for seculorum amen. It's the vowels for that, which is what you sing at the end of every Magnificat. So, and this is what the reciting tone looks like. It's mostly on one pitch, which makes it easy to adjust it to different lengths of lines. So now we're going to sing this uh, um, antiphon and the Magnificat, and then we'll sing the antiphon again. So here is the uh, text of the, of the antiphon, and that's actually taken from the text of the Magnificat. And then we'll hear the whole Magnificat and go and sing that again. of the Middle Ages, monks and nuns kept writing new music because they were really doing music all the time. And you can imagine they decide, okay, I want something new for next week or there's a new saint in town or whatever. Uh, or else it was just fun to write new music since that was basically their whole job. Uh, and chant was originally a, an oral tradition 
um, uh, like most musics in the world, but uh, music notation was invented in the ninth century, and, and once it was invented, notated chants sung at mass and office were collected in manuscripts, hand-copied books containing the music for the liturgy. And sometimes I had very tiny little manuscripts that were just memory aids so that you could go check it if you couldn't quite remember how that chant went. But some of them were really big manuscripts that you could put up on a lectern and a whole choir could sing off them uh, in church every week. And these manuscripts and fragments of these manuscripts are owned by individuals and institutions all around the world, including at McGill. And so now we'll have Anne-Marie come and talk about our McGill collection. Thank you, Julie. Good evening. That was chillingly beautiful. <laughs> the, the music that comes from these medieval books is just astounding. The, Medi uh, the McGill Library owns a, a significant collection of 250 European medieval manuscripts. The earliest fragment dates back to the 9th century, while the majority are situated between the 14th and 15th centuries. There are book formats plus a precious scroll showing the lineage of the kings of England from the first Anglo-Saxon king to Henry V, one of our earliest examples from England, in fact. These manuscripts in Latin or Western European languages are complemented by groups of early Greek, Hebrew, and Coptic manuscripts. In addition, we have a considerable number of manuscript charters papal letters, seals, and legal signed documents, primarily from the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. I've seen some of these documents signed by uh, kings of France. So about 50 items um, make up the selection of medieval music that you hear today. These are music related, including um, portions or um, entire works of antiphonals, graduals, <clears throat> missals, processionals, collectariums, responsorials, and any fragment of the above. Selection work required a deep dive into the collection to make up the widest gathering possible of candidates for the McGill Music <coughs> Faculty's project work. It is gratifying as a curator to facilitate research that contextualize and describe our collections for inclusion into reference tools and exhibitions. In particular, this series of funded projects led by Julie Cumming is especially thrilling due not only to the amazing research outcomes now available on the international stage, but also due to the immediate communicative power of their contents through song, as we've just witnessed. Their contents can be shared like no other document of the Middle, Egypt, Middle Ages, pardon me, with a range of audiences. We're so happy to see that. So it's been a pleasure to work closely with Professor Julie Cumming, along with McGill colleagues Anna DeBacker. I work personally also with Alessandra Ignesti, um, also Deborah Lacoste, and Professor Jennifer Bain, the latter of whom established the Cantus database, a searchable digital archive of the Latin chants found in manuscripts and early printed books. All of these projects have had high impact on our collections by promoting the visibility and discoverability of the manuscripts, which ultimately encourages further study. So a fresh, focused, and expert examination of McGill's exemplars bring to light the significance of even the smallest or mutilated fragment. As we participate in uplo lo uploading fragments to Harvard's digital laboratory called Fragmentarium, any one of our candidates could be the key piece to successfully constructing a codex online. Digitization in collaboration with Greg Houston of McGill Library Digitization Initiatives was a crucial component on our side in order to share the objects over various platforms and allow remote work to be carried out from several parts of the globe. So here you're seeing a portion of Medieval Manuscript 73, um, a large choir book. You'll have to picture this as being housed if within an imposing choir book from Northern Italy in hefty wooden boards 
uh, designed to be shared at a podium, as Julie just mentioned, so that several members of a choir could sing from it. This choir book was produced in different periods, which date from the 14th to the 15th centuries, and consist of at least eight codicological units bound subsequently together. Digitization permits the microscopic view of the finely produced Gothic characters, the musical notation on four-line staves, and there are large decorated initials. This letter H, for instance, was elaborately done up in delicate penwork by an artisan of the monastery dedicated to manuscript copying. Being the subject of so many events, tours, classwork, and projects, it is soon to be restored in order to allow this unique medieval artifact to continue to be examined and studied for another several hundred years. Incidentally, I like to imagine, uh, mention that the choir book was obtained by Dr. Casey Wood, founder of the McGill Blacker Wood Collection of Natural History of the McGill Library. He bought it in Florence, Italy in 1930 from a well-known dealer of antiquities there. Many benefactors have contributed to our holdings of medieval manuscripts, either by do donation of an object or by funds, such as the wonderful gifts from the Redpath family. These special contributors assisted Dr. Jared Lomer, McGill University librarian from 1920 to 1947, in the realization of his project to broadly illustrate the history of the book across all ages. Donations continue to this day. Just this past summer, we received a leaf from a small breviary of French origin on behalf of Dr. Ian Young, which ends up being one of the earliest items in this category dating back to the 13th century. So the state of the art overhead camera in the McGill Library's digitization services captures the object safely, safely from cover to cover, including the fly leaves where provenance details are apt to be recorded by layers of book plates, dealer annotations, owner signatures, institutional shelf marks, and more. Each page is photographed in full color and at high resolution. Greg Houston takes care to verify and edit the images as well. We're so grateful for his professionalism and graphic arts talent. So here we're seeing Medieval Manuscript 87, a fragment from a choir book, possibly from Spain, dating back to the late 15th century. Experts are still poring over this piece to determine its origins. Notice the ornately decorated letter F, which begins a line, and, and the left border decorated with various species of birds perched on filigree vines. Our selection of medieval manuscripts includes five complete <coughs> and bound works, but most are fragments. <clears throat> like the bifolium, a four-page choir, single leaves, excised initials and miniatures, or even parts recovered from bindings. This is the example we have here, medieval manuscript 2008. It's from a noted missal produced in Germany in the 14th century, and it was recovered from a binding. I have seen examples of incunables and early printed books in which the bindings are former antiphonal parchments. I have even witnessed a student presently on this stage uh, singing from one of our bindings. It was truly an exceptional experience. <clears throat> so scripts and decorative aspects demonstrate a variety of regional styles of different time periods and contribute to knowledge about the production of medieval manuscripts. Medieval scholars determine the origins of the manuscript by evidence presenting in the material artifact. For instance, the type of skin used to make the parchment or properties of the binding, or maybe its stylistic qualities inside, such as the layout, script, decoration, including illumination and color. Here we're showing examples from Italy, <coughs> showing um, differences in the large historiated initial letters in each. And they're interesting cases to study due to their colors and, and the border effects that they, they each have. You can try and search all of these on the internet archive by typing in manuscript and Tiffinals digitization project. You should find all of the some 47 items there. 
The description of medieval manuscripts is highly complicated. One manuscript fragment can represent a couple of pages of text. It will encompass physical characteristics, textual contents, sometimes line by line, decoration, arrangement, provenance, and scholarly references to the item. A team of specialists from McGill Library's collection services applied existing descriptions supplied by a resident expert codicologist to rare books cataloging standards. We thank particularly David Curtis and Megan Chilu, both trained in music, for their painstaking work in reviewing the descriptions and updating them where necessary. Revisions are ongoing as research proceeds. So we will have on display at the back here um, the Medieval Manuscript Codex number 111. It is in a contemporary binding bound in leather over wooden boards with metal clasps to keep the text block on parchment from warping. Provenance indicates that it was held by the Recollet in Bruges and its contents date back to the late 15th century. Specifically, it contains collects, orations, chapters, readings, and antiphons. A certain Johann Hildebrandt was the principal scribe and illuminator of the manuscript. Three more scribes have been detected who were active at about the same period, which is evidenced by the distinctly different scripts within the book. You will be seeing that with me hopefully at the end of this um, program. But let me walk you through parts of the description of the page you see displayed on the right. So you see that the, the layout is in two columns. The music is set on four-line red ink staves. The borders are exceptional and on a matte green background infilled with a running pattern of white red leaves and branches. The two columns of the text are divided by a shaft surrounded by a meandering leaf design. In the lower left column appear, appears a large four-line initial F in blue and red on square green ground infilled with scroll-like leaves, while three sides of the square ground are bound by dotted beads. Column two contains a two-line red initial E, resting on blue square bordered by dotted beads. And a similar treatment is given to a, a couple of pages later in this co codex. It is a fine example of late 15th century Flemish illumination and probably all executed by Hildebrandt. So, in conclusion, at the end of tonight's program, I welcome you to examine parts of this codex up close, feel the pages, look closely at all of this, um, all of these elements that make up just one page. I'll meet you at the back of the room. Or alternatively, come, drop in, make an appointment to Rare Books Library. We are located on the fourth floor of the McLennan Library Building, in case you don't know. So come and enjoy, learn more, and uh, take in these artifacts at your own leisure. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the behind the scenes things that Stephen was talking about. So this project is called SIPSA, and today I'll, I'll talk specifically about optical music recognition workflow for new notation. So SIMSA stands for Single Interface for Music Score Searching and Analysis. If you think Google scores, so you know what Google Books are, where you're allowed to search for words or phrases in books. Uh, now we would like to do that similar thing with music scores. So, so it'd be like Google Books, but in without Google. Um, so what we need is a technology called optical music recognition to enable full text search. Of course, you could type everything in, but it's very time consuming, and we try to uh, make that a little less time, time consuming and hopefully a little less expensive, but I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so once we have all this music in the computer or databases, we can do a large amount of searching and query, and we'd like to have access to these digitized scores uh, worldwide from a single interface or a website. So it's been a 13-year project. Uh, we're 
It's going to officially end in spring next year uh, and funded by you Canadian tax people, so we're grateful. Uh, so the big, big picture is we have the SIMSA and the OMR is the center. We have lots of digitized images. We have books and we have lots of library as partners. We have lots of metadata already in text and we have already tools. So we figured once we built it, hopefully people will come and use it. So what is optical music recognition? It's a process of converting images of music score into a symbolic computer representation such as MIDI, Music XML, or MEI, Music Encoding Initiative. So these are basically files, computer files. So we start out with digitized image or photograph of scores, and we convert that into some sort of computer readable file. Uh, and this whole process is called OMR. And there are several steps usually involved in doing this process, and it's fairly complex. So we start again, start with digitized score. We do some pre-processing. We do some symbol recognition. Then once we've taken everything apart, so we recognize the individual components, we can sort of put it back together in what we call reconstruction. Then we can put the final output. But in each of these major steps, we have sub-steps, something like binarization, which make colors into black and white, uh, noise removal, uh, structural analysis, what's actually on the page. We saw some of these initial that we might want to um, separate it out and an other image that we want to segment. And once we do that, we look for the staves, either four or five lines usually. Then we can look for the actual symbols, the music notes, uh, and we then figure out what these symbols mean and classify them. So once we get that all figured out, we can put put stuff back together, combine, combine them, and maybe assign uh, things like pitch or rhythmic values, and then we put the whole thing back together and get the final output. So um, why is this useful? Well, like I said, hopefully it's a little faster than human being to do this, uh, but it could allow, once you have music in a computer, you can have sort of automatic playback, you can uh, rearrange uh, scores semi-automatically, things like transposition, where you change the pitch of the music, uh, or change the mode, major into minor, and vice versa. Uh, we can do these music analysis, uh, large scale for searching and data mining, what's called distant reading, uh, that hu digital humanities people like to do. Uh, for publishers, we can reprint or reformat, so it's in a nicer format, uh, or we can have braille output for, for visually handicapped. And we can also do something more sophisticated, things like score following, which allows uh, computers to listen to music and it'll automatically flip the page of your score. So there are many useful applications. So a quick history of OMR. So the first PhD came out of MIT in 1966. 1970, it was the first published digital scan of music and that's all they could scan at that point, right? That's the entire scan. Uh, by 84, there was a Japanese robot who could read the music with his camera, or her camera, and play the organ accompanying a singer. Uh, and today, there are many commercial and, and open source OMR software. However, they're mostly for Western uh, common music notation that you're probably more familiar with. Uh, what we'd like to uh, look at are a little earlier uh, music, and we call that early music notation. And there's, because it was in the state of evolution, there are many different types. So uh, we need to have a very adaptive uh, software uh, that could recognize these different types of uh, notation. So let me go through this, this particular uh, workflow for doing the what's called the new notation. You see some of those, these square notations. And so again, we start with digitized manuscript. Uh, we do some later analysis and separating what's on the page. Uh, then we do some symbol classification, figuring out what these, each of these symbols mean. Uh, then we look for 
pitch, because uh, we like to find that out. And then we do the text analysis, which is important, because most of these chant are text-based. Notes are just uh, a mnemonic to remember how to sing it. So every text is, is adorned by notes, is what we look, like to look at. And, and the text actually already exists in what's called the Cantus database, like it was mentioned earlier. Uh, and so we have the actual text, we just don't have the, we didn't have the music. And once we have all these combined, we can actually create the output and into MEI. But because machines aren't quite smart yet, and there are lots of errors, so we need to correct the errors, and uh, that's called, there's a software called neon.js that we've developed, and right after this, Jen will uh, give you a video and showing you how that works. And once that's all fixed, we finally have sort of the out uh, interface for, for users. And Anna will talk, tell you more about that later. And this whole system is called Rodan. And it was developed by a PhD uh, student who was here, Andrew Hankinson. And this is the whole thing. So let me give you just a quick idea of how part, different parts of this uh, workflow works. So first thing we want to do is separate different what we call layers of the image, like separating from the, from the beginning. We want to just separate the text, notes, and then text. Then we can s send that off to separate software that can analyze these things. So uh, these things are uh, down with what's called the deep learning neural networks. And it takes quite a bit of time, but we can get fairly uh, good results now of separating just text or separating just staves or and separating the notes. So that's notes. And once you have things like things like the clefs, then we can figure out if once we because we know where the staves are, we can put up put everything back together to figure out what these pitches are. So we have staves and steps. So the left and right looks the same, but for us it's very different because we now know what's in the page, not just the image. So uh, the next step uh, for the notes that we separate is to classify the notes themselves and figure out what they mean. Uh, we can also find the pitch by finding out where the staff, we know where the staff lines are, then we still ex know exactly where those lines are, then after that we can actually get the pitch. And for the text, uh, as mentioned before, we do have the text on the page but we don't exactly know where these texts are on the page and we have to sort of match them, match them up. So we can do that, uh, doing some optical character recognition. Then after we do that, figure out where all the syllables are, then we now have to match which of these notes that goes with the text, right? So we match them up. All right, so once we do that, uh, we put it to this neon uh, editor, it's like a word processor uh, for music, and then once we fix the errors, we can put it out to our interface called Cantus Ultimus, and, and then we can work on it. So over the last 12 years, there's over 100 people working on this, a lot of uh, programmers uh, making it work, and this, this is people just last summer during COVID, we're having weekly meetings on Zoom. So. Here's our uh, Jen, who worked with us the last couple of years uh, on this uh, Neon Editor. Hello, my name is Geneviève gates Panton, and I'm reporting in video format because I currently live in The Hague in the Netherlands, as evidenced by this very European looking light switch. Despite being an ocean away, I have the pleasure of being the lead tester for the SIPSA project, which means that I worked pretty extensively with the online apps being developed by the lab. If all has gone according to plan, Professor Cumming has already talked about the medieval musical manuscripts that we have here at McGill, and Professor Fujinaga has presented the OMR, or Optical Musical Recognition, workflow. I am here to talk about the exact same things, but from a more practical perspective. So how the OMR can be applied to the manuscript and specifically what that looks like from a user's perspective, because 
That's me. During Professor Fujinaga's presentation, you've already seen this slide, which details the OMR workflow and Rodan's role in it. Let me show you what that actually looks like. This sort of software-y looking website is Rodan. So this is where hopeful humans, such as myself, can assemble the tools we need to instruct the computer to read, analyze, and interpret the folio of a medieval musical manuscript. This is sort of the home page. Let me bring you to the workstation. This is what we call the end-to-end -end OMR workflow. So this is where the computer analyzes and interprets the information on a medieval musical manuscript folio. There are just two things that you need to know to understand generally what's going on here. The first is that each of these little lilac gray boxes is what we call a job. And each of these jobs performs one very specific task on the image that is given it. The reason for this is that our brains are quite remarkable in that we can look at a sheet of music and pretty much instantly recognize everything on the page and understand how every element relates to every other element to create meaning. If a computer wants to do this, it has to break down that process into several specific individual tasks, which it will perform one after the other. These are those tasks. The other thing to know, and this is actually what makes Rodan so special, is the simple fact that all, every job is connected by one of these black lines. So for example, here, an image enters the job and a very specific task is performed on it. And the job spits out a now modified image. And thanks to this connection here, that new product flows directly to the next job where a new task is performed on it. A newly modified image comes out and flows to the next job and so on and so forth until the end. So as a user, all I have to do is input the original image at the very top, sit back, relax, wait for Rodan to do its thing, and collect the final product at the end. As a reminder, what I'm showing you right now is exactly what Professor Fujinaga talked about in his presentation. It's just that now this is the practical side of the concepts he explained. So at the top here, this is the very first job, as you can see, it's at the top. This is where I'm going to input the image of a folio. From there, it's going to flow directly to one of the most important jobs. This long one here is where the layer separation happens. So this is where the computer will take the image I've given it, oops, and try to find everything it thinks is a staff line, put it in one category. Everything it thinks is a symbol, so a noom or a clef, put it in another category, and everything else, which we will simply call the background, into a third category. And you can see that out of this job flow sort of three separate arms, one for each layer. So the symbol layer is going to go to this arm on the left here, and this is where all of the symbols will be separated and identified. And the middle arm here is for the staves. So the staff line uh, will be identified on the page. And you can see that at the end of this arm, the noom, the end of the noom arm is actually flowing into the staff arm because the nooms are going to be identified here. And once they're identified, they're going to flow into the now also identified staves so that both are combined and the nooms are pitched. And the third arm here is for the background. So the background layer goes here, and this is where we also add text. So the text is extracted from the background, split into syllables, and you can see how the syllables and the now pitched nooms are both going to flow into this final job here. And this is where all of the information that the computer thinks, whether rightly or not, is on the folio, gets encoded into a format we call MEI. That is just a code that is machine readable. And so this is what ultimately will allow us humans to search for very specific chant information on the internet. For example, text, or even better, melody. So we can search for a certain string of notes, 
and be immediately referred to the original folio that that melody can be found on. Let me show you what that code looks like. So say I started out with this chant. This is actually a folio from a McGill manuscript, specifically MS-209. As you can see, it starts with a lovely Ave Maria chant. So this is the image that I initially gave to the computer at the top of my OMR workflow. The computer has read it and it has produced an encoded file. Let me show you what that looks like. We can recognize the occasional words such as syllable or noom or pitch, but we can agree that looking at this, we humans cannot possibly conceptualize what this is supposed to look like. This does describe a piece of music, but not in a way that makes any sense to us. And that is why we need neon. Welcome to neon. Uh, this is the home page, which looks pretty sleek, but not what I want to talk about. So let's right away go to the neon work page. There we go. This is the real neon, and this is where the magic happens. So in the middle here, if I hide but for a moment these colorful glyphs, goodbye, there we go, you may recognize the image I just showed you, the Ave Maria chant from MS-209. So this is the image that was processed in the end to end OMR process, and this is the image that I now have an encoded file for. And Neon will allow me to visualize that file, like so. So these colorful glyphs that are overlaid on top of the original image are what the computer thinks is on that image. So Neon is taking that encoded file and showing it to us in a way that makes now perfect sense. And we can compare these with the original because they're one on top of the other. It's brilliant. So this is what we call the straight out of OMR file. So I have not interacted with this file in any way. It is exactly what the computer thinks is on this folio. You can see that in general, considering the size of the task, the computer is doing a pretty good job. Uh, the staff lines look good. The clefts always look very good. Um, and in general, the nooms are also quite correct. But we can also see the occasional mistake. Sometimes the pitch is wrong, like here or here. Sometimes a glyph is just missing. It happens. And sometimes something is just wrong. Like for example, here, there should be a clef, like at the beginning of every other staff. And, but the computer just thought that it was too puncta stacked one on top of the other. And the wonder of Neon is that I can see these mistakes and I can correct them. So I can, for example, move things around. I can move this just up one pitch so that it's correct, move this one down so that it's also correct. I can erase things. So for example, this, which I mentioned was not correct, I can just delete it, goodbye. And in its place, I can input what should be there. In this case, a sequence, like for every other staff. And each of these changes that I'm making are being saved. There we go. Uh, so that at the end, when I down, I, excuse me, at the end, I can download a new NMEI file, so a new encoded file, which now contains all of my corrections and is therefore perfectly accurate. And that now looks like this. So this is that exact same, you can recognize the same folio, same file, but it, con it contains all of my corrections. So I've gone over and make su made sure that everything matches perfectly. And you can see that indeed it looks satisfyingly neat. <laughs> the last thing I'll say uh, using this is that the neon colors, as well as being very pleasing, <laughs> are very useful. They're giving us information about the nooms and syllables on the page. In this case right now, what the colors are showing us are which noom components, so which individual glyphs, are considered to be part of one single noom. For example, these two blue boys here, rather than being two individual pitches, are considered to be one ascending two note noon that we call a pudatus. The way Neon represents that is simply by making them the same color. However, I can also get information about syllable, like so. And you may have noticed that the colors just changed pretty dramatically, and that's because they're now telling us which nooms should be sung on one same syllable of text. And I can add these colorful boxes 
to indicate exactly where on the original folio that syllable of text is written. So taking this first staff right here, uh, it has the word Ave, so the beginning of Ave Maria. All of these nooms are the same pale craft cheese orange because they should all be sung on this syllable a, ah, as indicated by this orange box. And this little virga at the end should be sung alone on the syllable ve, as again is indicated by the blue box. That is all I have time to talk about today, but I hope that my short presentation has given you an idea of why Rodan and Neon exist, how they work, and why they're awesome. <laughs> Now I'm done, I wish you all a lovely day. Okay, so uh, we're now going to move on to another piece of chant, and this is music for the mass, and in fact we're going to sing the piece of chant that you just saw being processed with uh, neon. Um, and so this is a music for mass on the fourth Sunday of Advent, which is the period leaving, leading up to Christmas, and so it's the time when you're anticipating the birth of Jesus. Uh, and in 2022, the fourth Sunday of Advent is December 18th, is so a week before Christmas. Uh, so the mass propers are chants that have text appropriate to the liturgical time of year, and that's partly about the life of Christ and the life of Mary and the pre-life of Christ in Advent, when, when he's still inside Mary. And so Mary is pregnant and anticipating the birth of Jesus. And so the text of this um, music for Mass is um, the angelic salutation, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Uh, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of uh, thy womb. And so you can see it's, we're focusing on that baby in the womb with this text. And this is what the angel Gabriel said to Mary when he told her that she was pregnant. And this text is set to many, many different melodies in the liturgy, sometimes very simple um, ones that are basically very short little prayers and sometimes much more elaborate ones. And this one is one of the more elaborate ones with long melismas, when you have many notes on one syllable, as we just saw that first ah in Ave Maria, um, that's called a melisma. And so that is one of the ways in which you make a piece of music more elaborate. It, so we're going to now go ahead and sing um, this offertory, Ave Maria.
So, you've just heard this wonderful chant, and you've heard this elaborate explanation of how to do OMR. You've heard Genevieve tell you the practical details of it, but you may be thinking, wow, this sounds really cool and fantastic, but what am I going to do with it? So, let's take a little step back and think about why you might actually want to search chant, and then I'll demonstrate what this might actually look like in real life and why it's so really useful for chant research. So as Julie has already said, understanding chant is really just crucial to understanding medieval European society. Even if you are thinking about people who weren't those who were those who pray, bells tolling for religious festivals and services could be audible throughout the whole landscape, probably not pulled by rabbits, but maybe. Um, and for those who were present to sing or listen to the chants of those occasions, the chants would tell a kind of story about the person, the saint, the occasion, or the idea that everybody was gathering to think about, and they would tell that story in a musical way. And we have a lot of data about these musical stories. Maybe we should say metadata, because chant is an oral tradition that then came to be written down for a very long time, we actually can see a lot of the variation that happened over time and place. And so we can analyze all kinds of differences between which saints were celebrated in a place, which chants would have been sung, what time of day they might have been sung, and so on. And those changes give some idea of what kinds of choices people were making and how things could be different from place to place, whether that place is from one country to another or just from one church to the monastery over the hill. And studying these data trends, if you will, can really tell us a lot about what these communities chose to celebrate and also how they chose to do that. Sometimes it would have been in ways that made them unique, and other times, maybe it's exactly the connections we're interested in, how they connected to other people who were singing the same chant at the same time, but hundreds of miles away. And there's some other benefits to digging in to these trends in the other direction. If we know where something was usual, what the normal th way of doing something was in a particular place or time, it can help us figure out where a manuscript fragment might be from, and it might help us think about how something could have sounded even when it's very hard to tell from the musical notation on the page, we might be able to compare it to other kinds of things from a similar region at a later time, for example. Now, there are lots of existing resources for this kind of chant research, but a lot of them are most helpful for working out things about texts. What kind of text were sung, what kind of different variations in words there might be, and so on. And that makes a lot of practical sense because it's a lot easier to work with text. Transcribing music requires a lot of extra expertise. It's harder to print if you're making a print volume. Who does print anymore? And it can be difficult to work with even when it has been transcribed. But that then means that the kinds of tools we have for even to deal with the kinds of questions we might want to ask are lacking a really important direction. So without a musical data set, it becomes hard to answer questions like, hey, are the manuscript, the, this manuscript, are the melodies in it like those everybody else had? Are they particular to a region? Are they really unusual? Are some kinds of chant melodies maybe more popular than others? Are there ways we could classify that? You know, that chant we just heard sounded awfully fancy, but is it fancier than other kinds of chants at the same time? And to answer those kinds of questions, we need to be able to work with the music. But as we've already said, transcribing the music by hand in a way that can be queried is time consuming and tedious. We don't want to do it. So let's do something else. We can do other things. We could bring the textual data that we have closer to the images of the music so we can work with them more easily. And two, we can use OMR to encode the music in a searchable way without it requiring so much human labor. And Conscious Ultimus, which you've already heard about, shows how both of those things could work. By the way, I will point out we've been mentioning books on lecterns that everybody could read from, so here's some probably Cistercian monks standing together, looking at their giant book altogether. Um, so as we've already said, there were new chants and new feasts being added to the calendar all the time, just for the fun of it. 
And here at McGill, we have an entire book, which Emery has already mentioned, that contains just chants and liturgies that were added to the year in this way. And that book is McGill's Manuscript 73, which we didn't bring here today because it's really big. It's for those guys. Um, it's pretty chonky, but thanks to the magic of technology, we can look at it on the screen, just a, a little bigger than life size, and saving our librarians a lot of toting and carrying. Um, this manuscript is actually still a bit of a work in progress for us. We've just freshly started putting it in, into Contus Ultimus. Even now, Genevieve, whom you just saw, is working on training the models to help us search the music for it. So you're getting to see some things today that were not even possible to look at two weeks ago, and which are just a fraction of what you might be able to see even a, a year from now. So one of those added feasts in McGill's Manuscript 73 is that of Corpus Christi. So this was a brand new feast at the late 13th century that reflected new ideas about the Eucharist. So a lot of medieval feasts are about a person, usually, like all these Marian chants we've been singing. Uh, but Corpus Christi came about in response to new theological and philosophical ideas that were current at the time. And since it was a brand new celebration, there was a period of time when it was still being decided what people were going to sing, what texts they were going to use, and what melodies they were going to use to best convey those philosophical ideas in musical form. And as it turns out, MS 73 is from this transitional period, so we can actually get a little peek into how communities went about creating new celebrations for brand new feasts. So let's actually take a look at this manuscript as it would look in Contus Ultimus. Now, a first thing you might want to do is figure out where in the book we even want to be. Books like this typically don't have an index or table of contents, so if you were actually leafing through these enormous pages in the library, you might be busy for quite a while before you even get to a first proper page of chant. But we don't have to do that because we have a search bar. So we can just type in our feast, Corpus Christi, and we can see it begins over here at folio 54V, and we can just click on it and go right to it. And there is our metadata just conveniently sitting here on the right next to our manuscript image on the left. So we can see the whole text transcribed. We can see when it would have been sung. This is the very beginning of First Vespers, alongside actually looking at the music. Well, that's awfully convenient. Now, if we go back to our search results for this feast, uh, we can actually see that there are quite a lot of chants for Corpus Christi because you have to sing all day. You've got to be busy from sun, sundown to sundown, essentially. So there's quite a lot going on, pages and pages of it. Um, and we go all the way down to page 80, and then something very interesting seems to be happening down here. So what we can see is that here at Fully 101, we've got this other thing that seems like it has the same text. We have two versions of the same text. Well, that's very weird. So let's actually take a look at these side by side. Now, MS-73 hasn't, as I sort of alluded to earlier, had the music fully encoded, which is why you're not seeing it on the right where the text is. But we already have this first step of bringing our data about the manuscript next to the manuscript. And that actually lets us see something kind of interesting, which is that each of these two things has the same text. They're actually both sung for the same feast. They're both being sung at the same time. They're both antiphons. They're even both mode one. But the melodies actually look pretty different. And that's something you might not have noticed if you were looking at a textual representation of this source. You might have gone and thought that this was exactly the same, but actually the melodies are quite different. So that's some information that we were really have liked to know about <coughs> and that Contus Ultimus lets us see. So maybe now our video is replaying. We would like to know whether the makers of this book came up with their own melody for this text or whether either of these was used somewhere else. And fortunately, on Contus Ultimus, we can actually look at these and search the melodies that are in the database. At the moment, this is a somewhat limited set because it's reflecting data that had to be hand-entered in person, but it can still sell us, tell us something of what we wanted. So. Let's take a 
take a look. Sorry. So let's actually search this database. I'm typing in what's called Volpiano, which is essentially the letter names of the notes. And let's look up this melody on the left, which starts DFD. We can see we're getting quite a lot of results. And after a little bit of refinement, we see that there's actually another chant that starts exactly this way for a, for a different feast, for Trinity, which is a pre-existing feast they already had. And this is actually quite a famous chant of its day. And we actually can, if we minimize Genevieve, look at how this would look. In a different manuscript, this is uh, from Switzerland, it's a monastic manuscript, and we can see here is our Gloria Tibi Trinitas. We can see its information about it over here. And in this case, because the music has been encoded, we can even have it sing at us. doesn't quite sound as nice as our chant choir, but it, you know, you can't always have 13 people singing for us all the time. <laughs> so in this, what that tells us is that in this version of our feast, people were taking famous melodies from, that they already had lying around, and they were using them, they're, they're really their favorites, their greatest hits, to embellish their brand new feast of Corpus Christi. So that's pretty cool. So, we've actually gotten to see a little bit of how musical borrowing worked in the Middle Ages. And so, that might make us wonder whether we have the same issue with our other one. So, let's give a look to that. We might wonder if this one on, version on the right came from somewhere. So, let's give it a little look and search here. D and we can see we've got quite a lot of results at the moment. It's quite a popular sort of little melodic gesture. But as we go on, we can kind of see that we're refining our search. We're getting closer and closer to our goal. And as we keep adding things in and refining our search, hello. Well, this is very interesting because we've got another melody it's also for the same feast of Corpus Christi. Well, we can actually take a look and see those guys next to each other if we like to. So let's, this uh, is in a Franciscan manuscript, so our friend on the right from McGill is an Italian manuscript. This is probably from Switzerland or Germany, somewhere north of the Alps. Um, and a totally different monastic tradition, no connection as far as we know. But they also had to have chants for Corpus Christi, and they used this one. They used it as a different time of day. It's a different text. But the melody actually starts pretty similarly. And if we can sort of get both of these on the same screen here, which is a slightly tricky to do, we can see that they do eventually diverge because the texts are different, and so at some point they need to set more syllables with different notes. Uh, but they clearly have this relationship to each other, despite being different texts and being used at, at different times of day. So, what does that tell us? Well, that tells us something kind of interesting. It tells us that there was communication happening about what text you should use for this new feast, and it tells you that there's melodies you should use this feast, but it also tells people didn't agree which ones were supposed to go where, and they mixed and matched, and they swapped them around, and they did different things with them as they thought pleased their creative impulses. And so, but this is something that we can only know about because we have the musical information that's been encoded and searchable alongside the textual data and metadata that's associated with it. And so that allows us to make these kinds of comparisons and connections between musical traditions in ways that actually take into account the musical information that we're really interested in. So in that lets us figure out more in turn about how McGill's manuscript 73 relates to other communities and to musical practices and compositional practices of its time. And the more data 
that we have access to and that we could search these kinds of things for, the more of those kinds of connections we'd be able to find out. And so that is something that OMR lets us do, and which is why it's really exciting. Okay, so we're going to sing a little bit more chant now. Um, so this is a Marian antiphon for Compline. And um, Compline was the, uh, the office that's right before you go to bed, and it comes from the idea of completion. The day is ended, comp, it's the same comp. Um, and so um, at the end of Compline, you always sing one of the four, the four main Marian antiphons. Sometimes there's some other ones, but there's four main ones. And these were among the best known chants among the whole community, not just the monks and nuns. And in fact, one of the Marian antiphons, Salve Regina, was sung by Columbus's sailors when they sailed across the Atlantic every evening on board deck. So it gives you an idea of the ways in which these were really popular uh, melodies. So um, we're now going to go sing this one. As you can see, it's praising the Virgin Mary. What's next after Simsa? Well, Simsa was about searching musical content online, uh, but we also heard from Anna and from Anne Marie that metadata is also very, very important. Um, and um, so once now we can do OMR for chant, and there's lots of music out there available in searchable symbolic formats, music uh, XML, MIDI, and so forth. Uh, and Simsa made it possible to search them. But if we want to really do research, we have to combine content search and metadata. And it's only when we can bring them together that we can really answer the questions that some of the questions that Anna raised. Um, so uh, Chero just got another big partnership grant called Linked Music. And um, this is um, about trying to search all those music databases, online music databases that are already out there online 
from a single interface. So instead of having to search in this one and then go to that one and then go to the other one and then hopefully figure out how they can connect the data from those different things, you can actually search them from one place. And that's what linked music is going to do. Um, and so it's building on all the work we've done with Contus Ultimus, with the DACT project, with um, and with RISM and many other uh, big online uh, databases that many different scholars have developed. Uh, and so we'll start with the ones we already know and then gradually work out over the course of the partnership grant to many, many different kinds of music all around the world, all different instruments, all different languages, all different writing systems. So it's very ambitious, but a very exciting project moving forward. So we're gonna end with one more piece. Um, and so um, this is a responsory for matins and we've already heard matins was the, mid, the one that happens in the middle of the night. It's the longest and most elaborate of the offices. Um, and responsories were the most elaborate chants, the most melismatic and also kind of unpredictable. You never know where that next phrase is going to take you. Um, so a nice opportunity to get a sense of, we started with the very simplest kind of antiphon with Magnificat, and we're ending with the most elaborate kind of chant. And so this particular piece is for um, All Saints, which was November 1st, um, and it's also in praise of the Virgin. And um, this one has several sections that repeat. So you can see that the quia ex te section comes back several times. And so you'll get to hear that three times and maybe you can, by the third time, you might be able to sort of predict where it's gonna go. Um, and this is from an English manuscript uh, in the chant tradition that's called the Sarum Rite because it's associated, it comes from the Sa Salisbury Cathedral in England. And they um, developed a slightly different version of chant, similar to what they were doing over on the continent, but not exactly the same. And it's a kind of special thing about English chant that's also really fun to sing from. And you can see the style of this manuscript is quite different also. So let's, we're gonna sing that and then we'll be done. <coughs>
Oops, I went the wrong direction, sorry. Okay, so I just wanted to give you the names of our wonderful singers, uh, which are a, a variety of graduates and under undergraduate students, undergraduates and librarians. Um, and it's been a great pleasure to sing with them this last couple of months. And I'd like to thank all of you and to our supporters, uh, in including Research Alive, of course, and to all our funders um, who have um, supported this really important and fascinating research that we've been talking about today. So thank you very much, and we really want to hear your questions. So some of our singers are gonna leave now, um, but then we'll be opening it up to questions from the audience. And So, any questions out there? And, um, and if you have questions for other people, they can come up and uh, answer them uh, up on the, on the podium, too. Yes, Stephen. Okay, here he comes. So that's where this deep learning stuff comes out. So we train what we want to see and, for example, ignore what's on the other side of the page that might be seeping through and anything else that we're not interested, we don't ask them to recognize. Then it sort of does its magic and it does fairly well now. No, it's just you just give them examples to say, so it's actually crazy for every pixel we label every pixel on a page. So there are about a million pages, million pixels per page. And we don't actually go one by one, but basically we have to tell each pixel, is this a background, is this a text, is this a staff line? Then it learns that it's crazy. It's pixel by pixel it learns. Yeah. Can you please use the microphone over there? Thank you. I have a question from the chat uh, from YouTube. So, Lucia Riley's. Uh, wait, wait, so is there a mic? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now you can. Okay. So, um, Lucia O'Reilly's uh, says, I would like to know why the Magnificat are notated on a five line staff instead of the usual four. Perhaps it's better to ask when the manuscript shown on the screen was created. Okay, five. Okay, four when the five. Um. Well, they started using five line staffs. In the beginning, uh, there were none. In the beginning, there were no staffs. And sometimes there was like two lines, a red line and a, and a yellow line, which were for C and F. Um, and then gradually they, uh, but the, the number of lines has more to do with the range of the chant. Um, and it was, a, it turns out it works out pretty well for most chant melodies, although they can also change the clef if the, if the range changes. It was really in polyphonic music that they start using the five line staff more consistently. Um, and, um, and then it eventually became normal, although we still sing um, chant from four line staffs if we're singing from the uh, black square notation, but maybe Anna has something to say about that. Oh, well, I can add to that, that it's also a sort of a regional thing. So one of the manuscripts we sang from, I think was the very first one we had on a slide, was from Spain. And in Spain, they started using a five-line staff a lot earlier. They also liked them a little bit in Italy. And a lot of the rest of Europe took a lot longer to catch on. And as Julia said, it's part because a lot of the ideal chant, there are treatises about what makes the chant good. And a lot of them say, you don't want your chant to have too big a range because it makes it too hard for people to sing. And when you do have a big chant range, they often just liked moving the clef around instead of having extra staff lines. Because staff lines take up more space and parchment is expensive. So keep it on four if you can. I, 
I, I noticed that all of this is for. Sorry, we need one more person. Okay, go ahead. I noticed that this is this is all re religious music. Is there any um, r records of, uh, of all this coding for, for folk music at the time? Um, well, yes, you do start seeing settings of vernacular texts. Um, um, say probably in the 10th century, um, but generally the people who were literate, the people who could read and write and could notate music were trained in the church. And so um, for the first couple of centuries of music notation, it's like 95% sacred music. But then once you get to the 12th century, you start getting um, significant amounts of secular music as more and more people actually become literate uh, both in uh, writing language and uh, music. Yeah. And also the, the, the parchment was very expensive. You know, most people couldn't afford a sheet to put any music on. So that was another issue. Yeah, and I mean, folk music in general is often not written down. It's often an oral tradition. So uh, that's the other reason you don't find it written down so much. It tended to be sort of high art music, like troubadour songs. There's one of the first genres of vernacular texts that, were, uh, that we have notated sources for. Hi. Um, how well does the program decipher uh, manuscripts without staff lines, such as the German uh, manuscript we saw earlier? So the humans can't. They don't even know what pitches they are. So I'm waiting for people to figure it. Well, actually, so what happens, one of the reasons we're doing this is that we're hoping that the same melody, as, as Aunt Anna was mentioning, might find somewhere else and later. So maybe the same tune may appear, which was staffless before, but with the same text, and it, we might be able to figure out that it's actually the same melody. Then we can then figure out the puzzle of these staffless notation, and that's one of our big goals to figure that puzzle. I mean, I'll just add, I, I heard a paper last year's Izmir, which is a music information retrieval conference, which looked at, um, at contours, uh, like what, what the early notations do is show direction, but not distance. So it tells you that you're going up or that you're going down, but it doesn't tell you whether you're going up a second or third or a fourth or whatever. And so um, uh, these guys actually looked at the contours uh, associated with each syllable of text and were able to uh, associate those with mode because certain kinds of leaps and steps come different, uh, behave differently in different modes. So that's, and they were doing that with staff notation. So that's a sense that we may uh, ultimately be able to crack this problem at least, you know, at least 50%. Uh, uh, some, a lot of those notations were just designed for people as a memory aid rather than actually being able to sight sing. The whole idea of sight singing wasn't really so big back then. <laughs> Hello. Oh, excellent. So my question, speaking on parchment, is expensive. How well does the OMR do with recognizing contractions in Latin? So, I, I didn't think, the, the Latin text you're talking about? Yeah, like what sometimes they would use contractions to try oh, to reduce the right. size of the text, so, and you have to know what the expansion is. Okay, so usually the machines aren't smarter than people, <laughs> so people can't figure out the contraction unless you teach someone. So that's what we normally do. We teach certain contraction or abbreviation or this. Then once you, it knows that, then you can do it. But you, you do have to tell it, teach it. That makes sense. Thank you. We were also fortunate to have transcriptions of many, many chant texts in the Cantus database. So those had already been um, expanded, the contraction has been expanded by chant experts and, and medieval Latin experts. So we, ha we already have a very large set of, of, of texts which have the, all the abbreviations spelled out, so that's a big advantage. Yeah, part of what's really clever about how the text gets matched is actually that it doesn't always have to know how every contraction works. Um, some of them can be taught, like having a, 
a line over a vowel often indicates that there's an M following, for example, so you can teach those. And then some of the other ones, all it really has to know is which letters are in it and how they match the text that, as Julie said, is already transcribed. And then it doesn't have to learn so many things. It just has to learn how to match the things it already knows with other things it already knows. Hi, thank you so much, this is so interesting. Um, I've been peeking at your music stand here and looking at the uh, pages that the choir was reading off of. I'm just wondering if um, you guys find it difficult to switch between different manuscripts, different notation, or different um, kind of styles uh, when you are going between songs. Um, yes, um, I mean that most of them, it's only the last one that is a really different one different notation, and that one we did have trouble with. That was hard. But the other, the other three were really very similar in style, black square notation, and was not a, a really much trouble uh, learning to sing it. I mean, these are all people who are good musicians and have had some training in early notations. Uh, so, um, so they were kind of used to that. Uh, well, we, it was really fun, though. I mean, <laughs> everyone really, we had such a blast singing together. So uh, I, I think we should do this every month so that we can keep on singing. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, everybody. And it's been a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much.